And folks, welcome to this hour of Tug's Jailhouse Radio Show. As many of you may know, we have are starting a series here of some of the artists and authors at the different comic cons that Tug has been part of. And this is our very first interview. We're doing it with Alexander S. Brown. We know those who know him know him as Alex. And we met Alex in November of 2015 at the Memphis Comic and Fantasy Convention. And welcome to Tug's Dollhouse, Alex. Hey, thank you for having me. Well, it is such a pleasure. I have just recently finished reading your book, um, Cerinthia Falls, and I have to say that I really enjoyed your book. I appreciate you coming on to talk about it today. Good. I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And as I stated, we did meet it uh, in Memphis, and you're a part of the group of authors that were you know, presenting your books for sale and promoting it. Um, have you always had an interest in writing and you know, attending Comic Cons to promote your your writing? Uh, yes, uh, I have. Um, I started uh, doing my writing when I was in high school, actually. Then and then it was just a hobby. It was the idea that I wanted to grow up and be an author. And so I started taking classes in high school that would help mold me into the author that I am today. And um, I did not have my first book published until I was about 22, 23. I'm, I'm 30 now, so it's been a good uh, amount of time since Traumatized first came out. And uh, that was originally done as a print-on-demand where I represented myself. Okay. And when I started doing conventions, that's when I was able to start meeting publishers, other authors, agents, editors, so on and so forth. And Kimberly Richardson with uh, Dark Oak Press, uh, the publishing company that has uh, published Renthea Falls, uh, she's responsible for pulling me over into her Dreams of Steam anthology books and I started submitting steampunk stories to those anthologies and it opened up the gateway so that same publisher and I we started talking and I uh, pitched the idea to him of Serenthia Falls and uh, he said let's see what you got well that is just and too so that's how it started well that is just too cool now to just let the listening audience know comic cons are not just about batman superman the avengers and things like that there are several genres that go into comic cons and it seems like you are kind of going with the horror genre how did you get interested in that have you always wanted to write in that genre uh, yeah, I have. I started reading horror at a very young age. I was uh, swooned into the genre by my grandfather when I was maybe five or six years old, and he introduced me to the original Night of the Living Dead, and that was when I discovered I loved horror. And when I was in my sixth grade year, perhaps seventh grade year, was when I started reading uh, adult literature a great deal more than young adults. Mm -hmm. and and uh, my journey had began with Stephen King, Clive Barker, Anne Rice, Dean Koontz, H.P. Lovecraft, and the list continues. And so the genre of horror and suspense is something that I always felt passionate towards. Um, in, in, in that group of authors you started reading, do you have a favorite of those? Or there's another one that you really like to lit read and possibly emulate? Well, um, as far as uh, reading goes, those are the main uh, authors I read that are in the mainstream. Uh, authors that are not necessarily in the mainstream, but have kind of dappled with it a little bit. Uh, I would say Jack Ketchum is uh, one author that has really been inspiring to me in a sense, such as Clyde Barker. They both push the envelope in what they write. Um, I have read uh, some, I guess what you could consider dramatic horror before, such as D.C. Andrews, um, and also I kind of dabbled with 
the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo books, which it's a horrific idea, even though the books aren't horror. Those are uh, suspense, mur- uh, murder mystery. Mm-hmm. But um, when I started doing conventions, that's when I had learned of uh, steampunk, and I had not read any steampunk prior to the Xavier Hess stories that I created and contributed to the anthologies of uh, the steampunk genre. So, um, it, it seems that most of my reading is based in horror, sci-fi, and also non-fiction for reference books, really. So coming into the whole steampunk scene for the short stories, that was completely new waters for myself. Yeah, and steampunk is one of my favorite genres of the whole comic con type <coughs> setting. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, like I said, I finished reading Strength Through Files. I found it <coughs> interesting that it's a, a werewolf story. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the werewolf has always been my favorite creature, and I think that uh, a lot of people tend to look at it as being nothing more than a creature. They don't consider the psychological aspects of it or even the many reasons why the werewolf idea was created to start with. The term serial killer did not come to be until much later in the 19th century. And so prior to that term becoming originated, serial killers were identified as monsters in regards to how they performed their murders. And so you would see some serial killers referred to as the werewolf or the vampire if they were cannibalistic. And so that had kind of stuck quite a bit. But even prior to that, there was many origins of fear regarding the werewolf, such as people believed that it was inspired by dark magic, such as how the character is in my book. And other people, uh, they felt that it was the fear of having relations with a beast and uh, therefore having the werewolf after that. And the two main concepts of how it originally began, uh, such as uh, the fear of relations of a beast or um, with it being of darker magic, I decided to take the route of darker magic with uh, Serenthia Falls. And some of what you read about the folklore and superstitions in that book, that's not the general Americanized superstitions of a werewolf. That is the ideas that had originated from Europe or Haiti. And Mm -hmm. so I already had that idea in mind that I wanted to create a story in regards to this creature, but I wanted it to be something a great deal more than just a horror book. So that's why I started adding elements into it that were, I would say, suspenseful, dramatic, and even some that are romantic. And when I was growing up and in high school, I was a friend of a large crowd of people. And amongst that crowd, I had friends who came from good homes and friends that came from broken homes. Mm -hmm. And so the character development that you see in that book is also what some of the things my friends suffered during high school were. And so this all just kind of came together. And at the same time, I thought, well, what a wonderful opportunity to tie the werewolf into this as more of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde character, since it's really a personification of the inner beast inside us. Yeah, I, I, can, I can see that after you know, thinking back of all the different twists and turns that the storyline took. And what I liked about the story, your storyline is that it's relatable. You know, there are a lot of communities that have their own set of legends of things that happen. And the peop- there are people that want to check out those legends. And like the teenagers in, in your book, they, they wanted to find, a couple of them wanted to find out. The others were, I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, it was just like everybody can relate to something like that you know some are just yeah let's check out come on fearless and others are like I don't know but you know I noticed that Serenthia who was the main character and it's most of it is from her point of view is kind of nerdy and someone that got bullied 
um, is that why did you choose someone to be the main character as you know the the, the nerdy bullied one inst as opposed to somebody that was popular or one of the cool kids well, uh, I feel that people who are classified as nerds are always uh, highly underrated and they're underestimated. And uh, pretty much uh, growing up, I really loved the book Carrie by Stephen King. And I loved the movie American Werewolf in London. And I thought, how wonderful would it be if these two elements came together? And so that was kind of the um, inspiration that I had that had already existed within um, entertainment. Now, I decided to make the lead character, Cerinthia, the nerdy bookworm, because bullying is something that is seen quite a bit today mm -hmm. and I think that sometimes it's swept under the rug a little too much and so is child abuse because the book is focused on peer pressure, child abuse, bullying, neglect, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And with Serenthia being the lead character, you have all of these elements not only in her life but in the lives of people she cares about that's feeding into that ticking time bomb that she has inside of her. Yeah, and and I, so I thought that uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to shine light on what some children actually go through, and show how some kids are actually made into monsters. Mm -hmm. and what, one thing I was that came to my mind during the during the reading of the book was why was Cerinthia so curious about the files? I never quite got that. Was it? Why not another local legend or something else that may have been a little bit more intriguing than the falls? Well, I wanted people to see through the verbiage that she was interested in it, mostly because the other kids wanted to go. And also, it kind of sounded mysterious when they brought it up. Uh, there's a scene in it where she uh, mentioned, in thoughts, I believe, that one of her greatest pet peeves is to not know the complete story of something. Mm -hmm. And when they first bring it up to her, they don't tell her the complete story. And so it's kind of gnawing on it's kind of just enticing her a little bit more to learn more about it and then the next day when she does discover more about the falls that's when her friends have already decided well let's make an escapade to the falls let's enjoy this area of course some of the friends do disagree with the leader of the group but um, she goes along with it and that's kind of where the peer pressure comes in is through their verbiage and she's kind of teetering on that line of I want to go I don't want to go but they're gonna go and I want to make friends okay so well, it, that's kind of uh, that's kind of what pulled her along okay well let's do what let's take our first break here and we'll be right back with a little conversation with Alex Alex Brown and his book Serenthia Falls and the Comic Con Experience right here on Tug Talk Tug's Dog House Radio Show on your rescue station WDNG. Okay, we're back. And welcome back, Alex. And getting back to our conversation about Strengthy Falls, I don't know. I, don't, I think it might be just me because I'm a little bit aware of this, but Serenthia and her friends, most of them seem like they were only children. Would that have, if they were given siblings, would that have kind of changed the dynamic as far as maybe a sibling would have given Cerinthia a hard time because of grades or whatever and added to the suspense of the, sh the story? Um, I'm not certain exactly how different it would have made Serenthia's life. I'm, I'm certain had she had a sibling, her life would have been quite different, especially if that sibling was a supportive sibling. Mm -hmm. But uh, growing up as a only child myself, I wanted her to be an only child because growing up I had no friends whatsoever in elementary school, junior high. And so I felt that giving her a sibling would have perhaps added another person she could turn to besides her parents. And I wanted just to cut off that altogether and just make her a loner. And with her enduring all the bullying that she did at school, 
I wanted her to at least have a home that was a safe haven, even though she was neglected in the sense of being ignored by her parents. Mm -hmm. And then when she did want to do something, the mother was overly protective, which can be just as harmful as being ignored. And with the friends who were listed in there, her little circle of friends, I never really went into great detail whether if they had siblings or not, except with Sarah, of course, because she's the only one that actually mm -hmm. has a backstory a little bit more. And so the sibling idea, it just, it was something that did kind of strike me, but it just kind of felt right for each character to be an only child. Mm -hmm. Well, I can write to that because I grew up an only child, too. And, you know, it, and I always found myself having a small circle of friends, like two or three, maybe four at the most growing up. But I was always very outgoing and I never met a stranger. But it was always very challenging to bring people into my inner circle, the ones to, that really got to know the real me. So that was my biggest challenge. But, mm -hmm. you know, I... I, I like the way that the, the story flowed, and the, the the end really surprised me. We don't want to give it away, because we <laughs> we would really like to have people want to purchase a copy of your book. But yeah, I think it's a it was it came along where to the point where people could relate to it to one degree or another, depending on your point of view. And, I th and that's what that's one thing I liked about the about your book, but um, this is kind of going a little, little bit different direction. Do you think that in the horror genre that some of it can become predictable? And do you think there's any way that a writer can come to a point where they're they can avoid that? Well, um, pretty much with the ending of the book. Only that part has ended. Mm -hmm. There is going to be a sequel. And so uh, it does become somewhat of an addiction for the author to be able to continue elaborating upon uh, a town or a series of people mm -hmm. where with this book, the sequel is going to take place in the same town. And that's the only thing that the two books have in common. Also, of course, with the little, little hidden Easter egg at the end of the book that um, I'm sure you picked out, but the second book picked up where you discover exactly what it was they saw that night as the book was ending. And so the sequel will pick up from there. And with with working on the series, it, it becomes a major addiction. And um, the sequel, I plan to have it at an older level. I plan to have it uh, where the characters are not young adults, but they are maybe in their late 20s, early 30s. And I want it to be focused on the dangers of spousal abuse. Okay. So the same characters at the end will be going into the second book? Or will it be... I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, I'm sorry the, the, I'm the, the characters sorry. that ended in Cynthia Falls, will they be moving into the second book? Yes. Yes. Uh, the second book will slightly pick up from the end of the first one, but it's going to pick up from the end of a different perspective. Okay. Okay. And, and so it's, it's going to kind of be like... Um, in a sense, how a comic strip does almost. You know how one, when one chapter ends, it just kind of bleeds into another chapter, but from someone else's point of view, and it goes on to a different journey. That's how this is going to be. And with the with the name Serenthia Falls, is did you name in the book because of Serenthia's fascination with the falls? Because that wasn't the name of the fa the falls in the beginning of the book. Yes, um, pretty much uh, the name was something I had tons of fun with. And it's also very symbolic because you have a character named Serenthia, and then you have the falls in the book as the little waterfall where they go and enjoy themselves. 
And I wanted people to not take the title so literally, but have it more so in the sense that it is her going through the downward spiral. It is her falling. It is her humanity that is falling. Okay, now I get. I think. Okay, I, I kept. I guess I kept putting a literal thought of. You know, did they change the name of the falls? later on and I was really fascinated that I can't help but wonder that the creature that was at the very scene the eyes that were seen at the very end I wondered if you know you have you have questions like is that who I think think it is is that going to be a part of what I'm guessing it might be you know you, you, it all well that's a really good quality of a book to where when it ends you have questions at the end, like, I wonder yes. what's going to happen next. And, uh, and that, that will be answered in the sequel. That's not going to be just left alone. It will be addressed. And I will say this much, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but with what you witnessed at the end of the book, with the eyes in the woods, it picks up from the eyes in the sequel, and it is not a werewolf. Oh. It is something else in that same town. Okay, well, yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I, I had never experienced, I had never read much about the transformation of a person that gets tainted with werewolf blood, so to speak, and the transformation of a, of a person. But with the way that Serenthia went through her transition, really fascinated me, and it, I did pick up that inward struggle she had with within herself you know, hearing that the voice like go ahead you know do it do it and the, the and the conflict between her and her parents and sarah and the way that she wanted to get revenge but it kind of came back and slapped her in the face so to speak well thank you uh with her transformation, I wanted it to really focus on how her internal conflict was becoming more visible on the outside. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you, you'll see that her changing is over a period of time. And also, um, it's as brutal as what it is. It's pushing out the old and giving the new. It's letting the evil out. And, you know, with her being a teenager, getting you know, finishing up her high school years and preparing to go to college, there's always a lot of changes that go on in, in the life of a teenager. And it seemed like with the changes she was going through, with, with the werewolf, just kind of amplified those changes that... Yeah, teenagers yeah, experience. Yeah, and, a, and, it, and it is somewhat of a, a, a swan song for her. It is intended to be somewhat of a swan song, and that's where you also see the struggle with um, her wanting to lose her virginity and then conflicted last minute of, no, I want to save this for the right person for these reasons, which the reasons are just as twisted as anything else in the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, I can appreciate that. Well, let's go ahead and take our second break for this hour, and we'll be back after these messages, so we can pay pay some bills with these commercials right here on Tug Talk House Radio Show on WDNG. Okay, folks, we're back talking to Alex Alex Brown, who is one of the Comic Con participants that. Miss Fee and I met when we went to the um, Memphis and Fantasy, Memphis Comic and Fantasy Convention. Um, was the convention in Memphis one of your f one of your first Comic Cons, or have you are you a Comic Con regular? 
in attendance? Uh, well, uh, I'm a Comic-Con regular, but I also do try to support local libraries because libraries are in dire need of help, not only from their patrons, but from authors trying to liven them back up. Uh, Comic-Cons are something that I've been doing for the last five years, and the first large one that I ever attended was Memphis Mid-South Con, and uh, that was held at the same establishment as MCFC known as a uh, Memphis Comic and Fantasy Convention. Um, pretty much I try to do five conventions a year, and then I try to do at least three or four book signings at libraries. Mm-hmm. And then I try to do uh, a, a nice amount at um, Barnes & Noble, so on and so forth. So I try to do the Barnes & Noble signings, maybe two, three of those a year. And I try to keep my dates open so that if... Um, an independent bookstore would like for me to come and sign for them, I can do that because even though I love conventions and I'm very gracious to be a guest at conventions, I try to keep myself open for other venues as well. Yeah, because you know, if it weren't for libraries, you know, where would a lot of us be? Is I'm sure that you grew up without an ebook, without a Kindle, without a Nook or any of the e-rate electronic readers you, know, you, you probably grew up with a tr- traditional book that you turn the pages and read and yes. I, I have an aspiration to, to write I've got a book written at home that I just have to do some you know corrections on and some edits and you know put it to print but I just haven't done that yet so I can appreciate the wanting to give back to what libraries and bookstores have given to us as far as being able to travel all over the world by sitting on the living room couch or you know at your favorite bookstore cafe or wherever you may be so the giving back part I can appreciate and wanting to support your local library I give you a pat on the back my dear friend because I really appreciate that the libraries are the backbone of what books are all about and reading is all about but um well thank you and that and the thing is we have so many fresh young beautiful minds not only in Mississippi but surrounding states as well you have so many smaller towns where young adults have an interest in perhaps writing this subject or painting this subject and it's not in the mainstream of what that area is and what I hope to do is especially for my hometown is to show people who are up and coming it is possible to write horror and to create this while living in a town that is so saturated with Civil War history. And Mm -hmm. we do have quite a bit of haunted history here, too. So, you know, that's kind of starting to catch on a little bit. It's starting to become a little more spooky, which I'm happy about that. Oh, yeah. I I can appreciate haunted history. One of my favorite cities is Savannah, Georgia, who has a lot of haunted history. I'm, I'm I'm just kind of strange that way a little bit because I, I, I like finding out what's about the different haunted places around town haunted haunts so to speak but you mentioned that you like like steampunk what what is it about steampunk that you really like writing about and reading about Oh, reading about it, just the creativity. Uh, I love the idea of steampunk weaponry, uh, tools, so on and so forth, but the fashion of it, the fashion is completely desirable. And when I started writing steampunk, that, those are some elements that drew me into writing more of it. And I dub myself as a horror author above anything. And so when I was writing steampunk, I thought to myself, well, you know, I could create murder mystery. And that's still kind of teetering on the horror side of things. And um, 
what really pulled me over into it was not only the subject matter of having a murder mystery, but also being able to elaborate upon the clothing. And it gives you the opportunity to create any sort of device that you could dream up and it be ran on steam. Now, you don't have to get the mechanics perfect to the devices that you create because it's a device that never existed. And there's a very good chance it's a device that's never going to exist. And so you don't have to be so technical with it, and it gives you more room to play. And so that's uh, that's one thing that I find really fun about writing, is with the steampunk genre, just throw it out there and give a good reason for it and create your own tools, create your own monstrosities with the subject mm-hmm. and just introduce the readers to something new. Well, the one thing about steampunk that I like is the time travel aspect. You know, you can be living in the 20th or 24th century and go back to the late 1800s early 1900s and take care of a, a murder mystery there and then hit another you know period in time that's what fascinates me plus you can bring in different different types of variations on dragons and other animals and like you said the the mechanics you can make up your own funky crazy little animal for what it's worth exactly so that I mean there, exactly. there's exactly some of the most oh I'm sorry that, that, that's okay go ahead alright um, some of the most fun I've had um, writing steampunk has been in a collection of short stories um published by Dark Oak Press. It's an anthology, actually. It's called Capes and Clockworks. And uh, this is a collection of short stories focused on superheroes with a steampunk twist. And I've always wanted to write a story about superheroes, and it it still does have my dark side to it, but uh, it's more um, uplifting. It's, uh, I guess you could say it's the flip side of the coin from the other pieces I've written. And um, that was really a great opportunity to have the chance to create my first superhero story while paying homage to the steampunk genre. Mm-hmm. Well, I, hats off to you because that, that's an area that I would like to try writing in, to, writing in, but I'm not sure if... I'm quite ready for it, but I know I'll eventually want to get to get towards steampunk. Maybe if I just give it a whirl, I'll manage to make it, make write some little short story or something in steampunk. But do you have? Any, are there any comic cons you're going to be attending anywhere in the near future or distant future? Uh, yes, uh, there is actually. Um well, I do have a few book signings here in town uh, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and uh, those will be in, let's see, February, February the 13th at Lorelei Books and February 27th at the Vicksburg Public Library. Um, conventions that I have coming up, I know that I'm set for River City, um, and that is located in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's going to be in June. That'll be around the beginning of June, and at the end of June, I will be in Sulphur, Louisiana for BayouCon. I've attended that convention for the last five years, and I would never miss it for anything. Uh, The people there are just absolutely wonderful people, and they do just about anything to make you feel welcome. Uh, Imaginarium which will be up in Louisville, Kentucky in October will be another convention I'm a guest at and I'm pretty certain I'm going to return to MCFC in November and perhaps Economicon in December so now, I, that's I, kind of what my lineup is right now okay well both Miss V and I attended the Memphis Comic Con and the Geek, uh, Geek Comic Con and I thoroughly enjoyed both. It's hard to say which one was the better of the two because they both had their own highlights and distinguishing characteristics that 
I liked both of, and they were. I thought they were really great places to go, and I really enjoyed seeing you at both both of those comic cons because. I, th- I think we all had a lot of fun at both, but of course, I don't know if you, if it happened to you, but Miss V got me arrested at the Geek Comic, th- Comic-, Comic- Con in Biloxi, <laughs> and so I had to pay her back. But yes, uh, there was there was rumor of an arrest that was going to happen to me, and I was able to dodge that bullet. I don't know how. Um, I did have to leave somewhat early on Sunday because uh, of the bad weather that was coming in, and mm-hmm. I needed to return home before that hit. And uh, I had uh, quite a few obligations I had to take care of there, so it was a rush on Sunday to get back to my home base. So it could have easily been that you know they were looking to arrest me on Sunday, but I had already skedaddled out of there. Well, what was really fascinating about when I got arrested was the fact that the gentleman who arrested me said it took me 45 minutes to find you. I thought, <laughs> well, okay. That must have been when I went and took a Coke Coke break. Went and bought me a something to drink and decided to sit down and rest my weary feet. But one thing I, want- I think that was a fantastic idea. They had to arrest people at the con uh, to raise money for their charity. That was that mm-hmm. was a really fun and idea. I, I think it was the, the the charity they were working for is the USO to help them out. And five dollars a pop that is that was the way to go. But we're getting close to the end of our interview. And if anybody is interested in finding out more about Alexander Stephen Brown and what you're all about, any suggestions of where they need to start? Sure. Um, go to Amazon.com if uh, you prefer ebook or you want to just snag a paperback or hardback copy of any of my titles. Just go to Amazon.com and type in Alexander S. Brown under the book section, and my author page will come up. But I really do prefer speaking with people and getting to know people, so don't be afraid to send me over a request on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, any of those, because I do love meeting new people and speaking with new readers and I always do keep a stock of my books on me so if someone would like to order a signed copy that would also be available so uh, I invite anyone and everyone to go into Facebook, Twitter, Instagram type in Alexander S. Brown and you'll see me pop up well that is excellent and Alex I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to me and discussing your book Sorrentia Falls and I wish you the best of luck in your writing career and well I'll next time I talk to you I'll see you on Facebook how about that sounds great and thank you for having me it's always such a pleasure to speak with you well same here and you have a great day and folks out in Radio Land here in Anniston. We'll see you next week on Tugsdale Couch Radio Show right here on your rescue station, WDNG.